look at, at the uh, outline um, that's been provided. Uh, and you will see we went through, spoke about uh, the, the styles of reasoning and all of that uh, uh, stuff. And you remember that uh, one point uh, that I made uh, in uh, yesterday's session was uh, this notion of cutting nature uh, at the joints and the, the challenge that uh, uh, scientists uh, have, and we all have, in, uh, uh, speaking that way. And one way in which we describe, I guess, one term that is commonly used when we talk about uh, the validity of concepts or the validity uh, of classifications. I don't want to, to belabor the point. I think that it's uh, uh, not such a complicated uh, uh, point to make. Um, but I do want to focus on one example uh, that for us in, in people interested in culture uh, and uh, psychiatry, uh, that's of great importance. And that is the notion of the self. Uh, and the notion of the self is obviously fundamental to everything that we do. It's fundamental, it's lurking in the background in uh, psychiatric classifications, and when it's not lurking in the background, it's in the foreground. So we're used to speaking uh, uh, about self, and the uh, very common uh, taken for granted knowledge is that the existence of selves, that each of us has a self, uh, is in fact uh, evident. We don't really have to, we can just take it for granted. And yet within the field of culture and psychiatry, it's one of the most contentious issues. Uh, and it is the issue with regards to the notion of the self. Um, uh, uh, and it involves really two questions. One question is whether the conception of the self that we take for granted is a distinctively cultural sense of the self, a distinctively Western sense of the self. And the person who wrote about this is most uh, uh, often cited <coughs> is the anthropologist, now dead, but very famous uh, anthropologist, Clifford Geertz. And Clifford Geertz uh, once argued in a very eloquent way uh, that uh, our conception of the self is a distinctively Western one that emphasizes autonomy and the individual, blah, blah, blah. I went through the whole thing. Uh, another famous anthropologist, likewise now dead, Mary Douglas, likewise made this point, said that our notion of the self, that we're deeply indebted to a, uh, a, a specific notion that emerges in the 18th century during the Enlightenment, um, and is given its uh, uh, initiation by John Locke. Okay, so that's one question. Uh, and there's a lot of written about it and a lot of debate. I don't want to talk about that one. I want to talk about the second question. And the second question is of much more fundamental concern to us in this course, uh, you know, given our shared interest, and it's not whether our conception of the self within psychiatry is a distinctively Western conception of the self, but whether in fact there is a self. That is to say, whether the concept of self, however you define it, however you discover it in whatever uh, uh, culture, is itself a cultural artifact. Or to put it another way, is it possible that there are some cultures, some societies that don't have selves, uh, that just look like us, behave just like us in every way, but is the self really essential? Is the self one of those facts of nature that we uncover? So uh, I want to, uh, uh, to, talk, uh, uh, to talk about this. Uh, and if you uh, look down these two questions, uh, and if you look down at the bottom of uh, page uh, two, uh, I, I've given you uh, my attempt to uh, identify the various kinds of selves uh, that uh, we are accustomed to, to, to using, that we use, and not necessarily compatible with each other. So number one is the Western self. 
And I've given you here Clifford Geertz's uh, description of what the Western self is. And again, that is simply taken for granted. How could it be different? And you see the self assume, is assumed to be a bounded, unique, more or less integrated, motivational, uh, and uh, cognitive universe, a dynamic center of awareness, emotion, judgment, uh, and action, organized into a distinctive whole and set contrastively against other such holes uh, and uh, against the social and natural background. Okay, there's a lot in there, but if you look at it carefully, you say, well, yeah, I, I, I parse this carefully, I read it uh, slowly, and I think that Clifford Gears did a good job. Everything is there uh, in, uh, in that, 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 that uh, definition uh, that he gives. In fact, it is a, uh, uh, a, 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 a subject of great interest within cultural uh, psychology, not cultural psychiatry, but within cultural psychology. And there is a school that emerged uh, within cultural uh, psychology where the greatest interest has been shown in this has been amongst Japanese and Chinese psychologists. And they've been concerned as, well, we do have a self, but the self is very different from what Gears is quite right. It's a very different sort of self from this. Uh, and maybe we should make a distinction between the two selves. Uh, the one self is uh, Gears's Western self, and the other self is an Asian self. Uh, that is uh, one, particularly Chinese, in contrast to Japanese, that uh, understands the self in a collective sense, not in contrast to society, not in contrast to other selves, the way that uh, Geertz describes the uh, Western self, but in connection uh, with all of those. And a, uh, a number of researchers, one named uh, Kitayama that I'm going to describe, I think, at uh, Michigan University of Michigan, has written a great deal about this, not from a philosophical point of view, but from the point of view of uh, uh, psychological uh, research, empirical research, uh, in which she divides up different groups and so on and so forth. And well, this idea that there may be two kinds of selves, uh, or, or two poles of selves, the, the autonomous self on the one hand and the collectivist self on the other hand, is also a notion that some anthropologists have suggested. And one of the most important uh, is a Marshall Solomons at the University of Chicago. Now a very, very senior, uh, uh, one of the last great anthropologists of the, the uh, 1950s and 60s, uh, uh, and who wrote a book recently on the Western conception of human nature, uh, in which he makes precisely this uh, uh, argument of, doesn't use the word collectivist, but a self that is a completely social self, defined not or understood or experienced in a subjectivity, experienced not in contrast or in opposition to other selves or to society, but as integral, as, as getting its meaning, as being created in the context of social relations and in the context uh, of society. And what Solons has in mind, and the argument that he is making, uh, is with regards to the so-called tribal societies, societies in, and traditional societies, societies in which the uh, uh, dominant social idiom is an idiom of kinship, uh, and so on. So we get the idea of uh, uh, what this uh, debate is about, and certainly, again, uh, one that has a prominent place within uh, uh, cultural psychology, but also cultural psychiatry. Uh, 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 okay, number two, another kind of self. I think that we can also speak about the expert self, that there are communities of experts. Ah, you don't use words like community, do you? You use words like 
Denk Collective, right? Okay, Denk uh, Collective uh, of experts that have a distinctive set, uh, uh, sense of self. So we can talk about the psychoanalytic self. And the psychoanalytic self is really quite different uh, from uh, 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 Geertz's notion uh, of the, the uh, Western self. And that we can contrast this even with the self that emerges uh, in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. <clears throat> you go back and look at the origins uh, of cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, it's with Aaron Beck, a uh, very famous uh, psychiatrist at the University of Pennsylvania, who developed a cognitive theory uh, a, a approach to depression. And he also has a very distinctive uh, uh, sense. So there's the, 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 that also. There is number three I list, uh, have uh, listed here, <coughs> the idea of an introspective self. And the idea of an introspective self is one that we find most often amongst people who subscribe to the Western self. What is the introspective self? Well, it's the idea of an inner self. And you say, an inner self? Well, of course, I have an inner self. We all have, you think this is me, really, that you see in front of you? Alan Young who says all these silly things and gets mixed up and so, no, inside there's, there's another self, much, well, I won't describe uh, what, but you get the idea that we have. And what that self does, as you all know, the, the, what that self does is monitors the outer self, remembers what the outer self is, is embarrassed by uh, the outer self, manipulates the outer self, does all of those things. This is the idea of, and it's a very Cartesian notion. And the philosopher Daniel Dennett once described this view of the self as the Cartesian theater, that inside the mind, can't say the brain yet, but inside uh, the, the mind, there's an inner self, like a little homunculus. And he or she is sitting in front of a, 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 a theater, a screen, uh, nice, relaxed, and watching on that screen, and is watching on that screen, projected onto that screen, is everything that passes before our eyes, uh, and that comes into uh, our own consciousness, and is an outside observer, or another observer, on ourselves. And that's exactly what the inner self is, right? I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, is it? except what I'm telling you, uh, anything that you don't know, is that not every culture believes that, and that there's a powerful argument against it. And that argument begins with one of the great philosophers of all time, someone of enormous importance for us, not for us in anthropology, but for us in cultural uh, psychiatry, and that's David Hume, the British, or actually Scottish, uh, philosopher uh, of the 18th century. And Hume's just the normal, I won't go, to, I'd like to talk more about Hume, I just want to talk about one thing that, that Hume, uh, observation that Hume made that endures with us today, is very, very uh, important. And Hume was not only a great philosopher, in one way you could describe him as one of the first psychologists, uh, because he was not interested in the mind in the abstract sense, but in the empirical sense. He wanted to, to, to have a philosophy that was based upon uh, uh, empirical evidence, that is to say, upon experience. And he also had a perspective that was a cross-cultural perspective, really quite uh, unusual in this regard, uh, one that when we talk about things like the self should be a fact of nature and not a fact of culture. Not the, not the Anglo-Saxon self, but the self that everyone has. So he says, well, uh, everybody talks about the self. We go back to Descartes in the previous uh, century. Descartes even knew where the self was located, in the pineal gland, in the, the brain. Okay, and we know that this self is a kind of secular self that replaces the soul from previous generations and so on. Everybody talks about it, myself, my inner self, and blah, blah, blah. He said, great. He said, 
Now I want to ask, what's the evidence of it? Empirically, what the evidence is. And this is before the days when uh, people who had questions like that became professors of psychology and then inflicted questions of that sort on hundreds of undergraduates and they had to, to, to answer and then it was run through computers uh, with regards to that. And uh, Hume had an N of one. Uh, and the one was David Hume. Uh, and he said, I will have an experiment, a thought experiment. The only way to do things is empirically. Uh, and the experiment is, I, is an experiment, if you forgive the expression, of self-reflection. I will reflect upon myself and I will look into myself to see what I can identify that exists beyond language exists beyond the way in which I talk about the self and I interact with everyone in terms of a self. The self as a, uh, as a cultural reality, Hume says, is undeniable. It's embedded in our language, in our everyday life. But when we're serious about the self, we want to see if there's something more than that. If the self, to use a popular term, if the self consists of more than a language game that we engage with one another. So Hume says, on numerous occasions, I've done that, I've isolated myself, I sit in a chair, I reflect upon myself, and he said, in each of these experiments, I come up with the same result. When I look into the depths of consciousness to find the self, I always find the same thing. And what I find is David Hume looking into consciousness, looking for a self. And he comes to the conclusion and he says, listen, I'm not saying there is no self. He said, I know. All I can tell you is that there really is no evidence uh, for uh, a self. And if we're going to be empirical, the closest that we get to uh, 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 mm, explaining what the self is, is that there are a bundle of attributes. There are a bundle of capacities, a bundle of predilections, of tendencies, uh, a bundle of passions that are driving these. He said, there's just this bundle, and they're all bundled together, and that's it. And if you think you can assemble them into some sort of a structure, uh, some sort of a system, some sort of a, a, a unity, that is distinctive to, to David uh, Hume, he said, I don't think to you, I, I don't know anyone who's done it, and I haven't done it. The closest we come to it, and this is an enormously important point for us in, in cultural psychiatry, uh, and, and worth uh, the whole summer, just this, this one question, and David Hume says, well, where does the conviction that we have a self, where does our experience, our subjectivity come from uh, if, in fact, there's no evidence that there is? And this is not a philosophical question. Again, I want to make the point that at this point, Hume is, in many ways, the father of cognitive psychology and psychiatry, and not, you know, brush them off. Oh, those philosophers, they always have these abstract ideas. Absolutely nothing, this is exactly the opposite uh, of abstract, could not be more concrete uh, because he wants to talk about, uh, <coughs> in this sense, he wants to talk about experience. So he asked the question, where does the conviction that we have a self come from? And he gives an answer, and it's not his own answer. It's the answer of the great philosopher who precedes him and that is John Locke, also a, a well, not Scottish in this case, a, a English uh, philosopher, John Locke. And John Locke is writing at the beginning uh, of the 18th century, end of the 17th century. Great, great man, as you can see, we'll talk about him in a bit. And Locke also asked this question, he asked the question uh, uh, decades before Hume, and he came to a conclusion and I'm going to put words in his mouth, but his conclusion is that if there is a self, it has some continuity. What is the nature of the continuity of the self? 
And he asked the question that interested Hume, and it was so puzzling to, to Hume, not as an observer of other people, but of himself. And that is, if there is no self, how come I go to sleep and I wake up? And when I wake up, I'm still David Hume uh, in, in this way. There, there, there's some continuity here. What's exactly what is going on? And I cannot, well, I have to rely on Locke to explain what in fact is going on. Now, unfortunately, we know that there are clinical syndromes where people go to sleep and they wake up and, and they're not David Hume again. They start all over again. In fact, they start all over again many times during uh, the day. Uh, and Korsakoff syndrome is uh, a, a, an example uh, of that. And there was a uh, very good film, you probably watched this on uh, uh, YouTube, uh, certainly uh, to go on the web, that was made by BBC maybe about 15 years ago. And I have the feeling that Jonathan Miller, a very famous psychiatrist, British, and writer, uh, was part of the program. And it, it's like watching a play, except it is just overwhelmingly sad. Uh, and it begins, and there is a, a room um, in an institution somewhere, very nice with uh, uh, a couple chairs, uh, and there is a man sitting uh, uh, in one of the chairs, and he must be in his maybe early 30s, maybe mid 30s, really a nice looking guy, uh, shaven, dressed nicely, um, could be an academic, in fact he was an academic, uh, and uh, he is uh, uh, sitting in there, uh, and there's a knock on the door, and he says, come in, please. He's also very polite. He says, come in, please. And a woman uh, walks in, and he says, hello, how are you? Uh, it's a lovely day. And she sits down with him, and they begin a conversation, uh, speaking uh, uh, to one another. And this goes on for about five minutes, and then she says, well, thank you, it was a great pleasure to meet you, uh, and tells him her, her, her name and so on, so a great pleasure to meet you. Uh, they shake hands and she leaves uh, and goes out. Then we're told this is his wife and that he had had uh, a, uh, a cerebral infection, terrible encephalitis, and as a result of this, uh, it had uh, affected, destroyed, uh, much of his uh, memory, long-term memory, episodic uh, memory, and he doesn't remember her. You say, geez, this is really sad that she comes in. Well, if you think that's sad, then the next frame is about an hour later. Please come in. The same woman comes back in, and everything is repeated all over again. Has no idea who she is. He's very polite, and what's remarkable, he's got all the social skills that he has. He's got all the linguistic skills. You would never, never guess, if you've just seen the first uh, uh, frame, the first episode, what was going on, and said, what is strange that's going on here? You said, there's nothing strange. I, mean, I don't know. Is he uh, shirt buttoned properly? Or I don't know. Everything looks fine to me. Uh, because it does look fine, so that all of his social skills are your lingua. Well, you get the idea. Okay, this is in a sense an experiment that replicates what Locke concluded. And Locke concluded that the continuity of the self, that which guarantees that when I fall asleep and I wake up the next day, I'm still John Locke, is a psychological continuity. It is a continuity of consciousness, and another way of putting it is that it's a continuity of memory. And in fact, the self exists in terms of memory, at least empirically uh, when we look in terms of networks uh, of memory. And uh, uh, Hume's conclusion is exactly the same sort of thing, that it is autobiographical memory that uh, is the foundation, subjectively, for what the self is. And from Hume's point of view, he says, well, if you're satisfied that 
uh, uh, this uh, subjective sense of the self is enough to define what a self is for you, then you've got a self. But if you want to go beyond that, I don't know what it is. So you see, the, the argument he is making is, I think, not hard to understand, but extremely subtle, has in very, very great implications uh, for us with regards to uh, 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 psychiatry altogether. Now, this idea that the uh, human skepticism is picked up by a great French psychologist, a, a man who also starts out as a philosopher and then becomes uh, a famous psychologist in the uh, 19th century. And this is Théodule Ribot, the person that uh, I have down here. And Ribot is an absolutely great, great scientist and the, 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 the founder of an important uh, uh, scholarly uh, 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 journal. He was uh, uh, also the person who translated and introduced into uh, French uh, the British Enlightenment philosophers and uh, French uh, translation. So he was deeply immersed uh, in, in this literature, but he also had a clinical practice. And his clinical practice centered on maladies and memory. Uh, and he became one of the great, or not one of the great, 19th century expert on maladies of memory. And his interest in maladies uh, of memory was framed in the context of the self, of the relationship between autobiographical memory. Uh, so it was not like Helmholtz who was interested in short-term memory and all of that. He was interested in autobiographical memory those kinds of memories that constitute a self or a sense of self or subjectivity uh, and continuity uh, over time. Uh, and he based his theories, his writing rather, not theories and descriptions, not on abstractions and what logically should be the case, but on his clinical experience. He had lots and lots of clinical experience um, uh, that he passed on to other people. He had uh, two very famous students. One of those students was Pierre Genet, and I'm sure many of you know who Genet was, and anyway, one of the, the founding ancestors of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, very, very great uh, um, uh, psychiatrist, uh, psychologist, who then became a psychiatrist. Decides, after his uh, training with uh, Ribot, this is not enough, I want to become a psychiatrist, becomes a physician, and starts doing work, very famous for studies of dissociative identity disorder, you know, dual personalities, and so on and so forth. For a while, uh, a rival of Sigmund Freud's in the early uh, 20th uh, century is very bitter the way that things turned out. So, and uh, uh, Genet's great student was who? Was Piaget. Uh, and Piaget's notion of the maturation of the child and the mind of the, the child, uh, the uh, ontogenesis of the mind and identity and so on and so forth. Uh, 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 he, he's standing on the shoulders of Genet, who's standing on the shoulders uh, of Ribot. But I said Ribot had two famous students. The other student was Marcel Proust. Uh, and I don't have to tell you how important memory uh, became, autobiographical memory became for Marcel Proust in his uh, 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 masterwork uh, in the same sense. So Ribot is really a, a, an extraordinarily interesting, uh, extraordinarily interesting person. And he wrote uh, 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 several important books and translations but the most important one could be translated into English as maladies of memory. And the book is just, I, I can't imagine more pleasurable, well, yeah, I shouldn't say that, uh, but it's a very, very pleasurable book uh, to, to read. Uh, and particularly if you come to it knowing nothing about uh, Rebo, uh, knowing nothing about the debates about memory, and culture and self and so on and begin to read it. And he says, when people talk about maladies of memory and I look at the patients that I uh, uh, have here, 
it's really very interesting, people are almost always talking about the same kind of memory, uh, uh, the, the same kind of malady. They're talking about the loss of memory, whether it is permanent or whether it is uh, 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 episodic, you know, amnesia. He says, that's really people, great interest is in uh, amnesia. And for most people who would write a book on the maladies of memory, that's all that they would write about. They'd write about the erosion of memory and dementia and, and, and so on. He says, undeniably, that is very uh, important. He said, but a fundamental mistake is being made. And the fundamental mistake that's being made is that the deletion of memories and the loss of memories is intrinsically pathological. And he says, I don't mean intrinsically pathological, that it's not intrinsically pathological to say that uh, uh, it is really something good. He says, well, let, let me explain what I mean. When we talk about loss of memory, permanent loss of memory, uh, we, all of us, I mean, it's a frightening, frightening, uh, that's what happens to this poor guy that I just described in the BBC program, who had the, the encephalitis. It's hard to imagine a, a mental uh, uh, ailment more terrible than that. And that's, of course, what frightens us, I think, with all justification, with regards to Alzheimer's disease. And we know those numerous books that probably have had these terrible titles uh, and, and TV programs. And, and they're terrible because they're true. You know, they have titles like, Is Anybody In There? Uh, about daughter's account of her father's Alzheimer's disease. Well, we understand what the title refers to. Is there a self in there once the autobiographical memory is gone? Rebo says, I'm not going to add to this. You all understand, it's easy to understand. I want to talk about some other uh, maladies of memory. And, and, and he talks about a, a long, a very interesting cryptoamnesia. Love to talk about that, uh, but we don't have time uh, uh, here and it's really not part of what we're talking about. But he talks about another time and he calls it hyperamnesia. Uh, and hyperamnesia means to remember everything. We say, why, why is this in a book on maladies of memory? My God, hyperamnesia. This is the dream of every university student uh, uh, to have this, to, 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 to hear something, remember it, to read something, remember it, or to be able to go back and blah, blah, blah. And Ribot says, so you would think, until you meet people, who have the, and there are people who have this capacity. If any of you are interested in this, uh, there's a wonderful, wonderful book that is written by another person who in, uh, intellectually is a student of Rebo, and that was the great Soviet psychologist of the 20th century, A.R. Luria, L-U-R-I-A. And it is, it's, it's, it's like reading a novel. In fact, it is like reading a novel. That's what the great uh, Argentine writer, Luis Borges, concluded when he read Luria's clinical account. And he said, it is like reading a novel, and I'm gonna write the novel. Uh, well, he didn't write a novel, but he wrote a famous story. And if you know Borges, B-O-R-G-E-S, the story is Funes the Memorius. And Funes the Memorius is a gloss on Luria's account of a patient that he treated and inspired by Ribot's account, maladies of memory, on this condition called hyperamnesia. And Luria's case is just utterly fascinating. It's a man who becomes a memory expert. And, well, I don't have time to, to, to talk, I'd love to, uh, to, to talk about it. Let me talk about uh, Ribot's point. And Ribot's point is that when we talk about uh, a self, however we want to define it, and we really have a problem. Oh, you don't have a problem because you're English speakers, but we have a problem in French uh, because we don't have a term that corresponds precisely to the English word self. But let's pretend that we, we all share the same notion uh, of uh, self, and, uh, uh, and uh, this uh, self that we have 
he makes the, the point is a creative, it's a product of memory. Locke is right, Hume is right. There are memories, these memories then become associated with an, uh, one another. There's a web of memory, they blah, 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 blah. He said, however, the self is a continuous effort, or at least this sub form of subjectivity that we call the self, or self-awareness, uh, is a continuous effort. It's going on all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even when we're asleep, uh, it is going on. And it is a process not only of the creation of new memories and new associations, but also the deletion of memories, the, 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 the shaping of the self through this pruning of well, you understand the point he's making. His point is that if there's no pruning, there is a gross distortion of subjectivity uh, and the, the self that is not only pathological in a formal sense, but is profoundly debilitating. Uh, and Luria's case is an obvious, this man who's just totally uh, sad, unhappy uh, of this life, of, of not being able to forget uh, anything. So Luria makes this point of the, the again, of the uh, forgetting and how important forget, that forgetting, he comes to the conclusion, is as important as remembering. Now for us hearing this notion, Ribot's notion, in 2012, we say, my God, what's a wonderful idea. And what's so wonderful about it is that we know how the brain develops for example, uh, and the maturation uh, of the, the brain uh, and the, the idea a lot of the silly people have that, oh, it used to be a, a, a foundational idea that you're born with a, a collection of neurons and gradually began losing them until you become foolish over time. They can never be replaced and blah, 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 all of those sorts uh, uh, of things. And then we learned that the uh, individuals with the greatest number of neurons are very young children. And that the maturation of the brain and the mind is not through the production of more neurons, but through the pruning uh, of neurons. And that in fact there would be a profound uh, uh, mental uh, disability if that pruning doesn't occur. And there are theories of autism, for example, say so that the problem with uh, uh, autistic children is the fact that this pruning process did not, okay, you get the idea. So the pruning of neurons and the pruning uh, of memories have got a, a, an interesting sort of uh, parallel uh, in this regard. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, Ribot's notion. Uh, and the person who's written about this in the most elegant way today is a philosopher. Uh, and I encourage you to, to go, you can read very, a philosopher with uh, uh, much, much interest uh, in psychiatry. And that is Sean Gallagher. Uh, I've been in University of Central Florida, now he's in the UK, but in any way, very, very famous guy. Uh, and his notion is, and a phenomenologist, and his notion is that what we call the self is essentially a narrative self. That the self consists of a story that we tell to ourselves uh, and that we represent to other people. And the self exists in the form uh, of this narrative. Again, a very controversial uh, notion, person who likes to talk a lot about this is uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Kiermeyer. Get into good arguments with him uh, 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 on this subject. Lawrence is not a Humean skeptic. Uh, he is convinced, he's, he knows all this very, very well and understands it very well. Uh, but his argument is that Hume couldn't find it but it's there, uh, and there is some kind of a structure uh, that, um, uh, that, that deserves to be called the, the self, and that exists outside of the Cartesian theater and so on and so forth. So 
Next time you see Lawrence, just say, what do you think about the self, Lawrence? Um, uh, 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 yeah, and, and his notion that there are no cultures where there's selfless people. There, there are people who are selfless. That's, that is quite true. And it is a profoundly pathological condition. It's not a universal condition. And within psychiatry, one term that we use for that is depersonalization. And the idea of depersonalization, I mean, just the, I mean, and there are other forms of it too where there's a, 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 a loss of the sense of inhabiting a body uh, that, that people have. But okay, clinically, there are selfless people. And Lawrence says those are the only selfless people. Uh, uh, unlike the rest of us. It's not a, uh, a universal state. Okay, and finally we come down, well not for almost finally, uh, we come down to the, uh, uh, the last of these selves, uh, which is not inconsistent with uh, uh, the Western self or the expert self, uh, um, or even with a human no-self, uh, and that is John Locke again. You say, enough with John Locke. Uh, let's move on. We're supposed to be talking about the motion this morning. I will talk about the motion. Uh, but it's not enough for John Locke, uh, because John Locke made another uh, point, uh, absolutely uh, marvelous. And he says there is a self that's undeniable. Whatever other selves exist alongside it, and he said, and that's why we've got to understand it, as there are multiple selves. I'm not arguing that this is the authentic self, but there are multiple selves. And he calls this the forensic self. And forensic means law. Uh, and he says there is a self that is identified in terms of culpability, that is in terms of responsibility. Not only in terms of the law, in terms of formal legal institutions, but in terms of uh, uh, the moral commitment that every individual moral responsibility and moral accountability is the, the term most often used, moral accountability that exists in every single uh, society, even for children, have got, although it's a diminished moral uh, accountability, but there is moral accountability. And he makes uh, the, 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 the uh, point, as we have here, it is the locus of moral and social responsibility. It is the self that emerges in terms of roles, identities, rights, obligations, and privileges. Uh, and also it is a, uh, a sense of the self, the forensic self, that has got two distinctive qualities. One quality is the quality of reason. Uh, and uh, however you want to describe reason in a very broad sense uh, of uh, reason. And part of that reason is the recognition that people have intentions. Those intentions give rise to motives. Those motives give rise to behavior. So that that behavior, purposive behavior, can be traced back to certain decisions that the individual has made uh, and, uh, and certain inferences that that individual has made. And then you say, oh, please, no more of this. I can't stand it. This is, brings back terrible, forgive the expression, memories uh, of psychology 101 in which they put down the intentions and the, 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 the motives. And so you're right, it is psychology 101. It's not that Locke copied Psychology 101, so Psychology 101 takes the, 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 the same sort of ideas. So the idea of reason is without reason there can be no moral accountability. However, the other element is memory. And Locke's argument is that no only is autobiographical memory that which guarantees that when I wake up in the morning I'm still John Locke. Even if that were not true, I would help be held by my community for being John Locke when I wake up. I can't escape being John Locke, even whatever delusion I have in the, 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 the morning. Because John Locke, that identity, that self, 
is not something that I own myself, but rather is a product of the society in which I live, the, the, this idea of the forensic uh, uh, self. So I'll give you an example, uh, one concrete example, and you'll understand everything that he is saying. Let us imagine uh, a, a, a man who commits a heinous crime of some kind, maybe not such a bad crime, maybe steals a lot of money, I don't know, kills a couple people, whatever it is, when he's about 30 or 20. And then he goes through life and no one knows about what he has done. And he ends up being, we'll make this not so unpleasant, about 90 years old and he's demented and has got uh, no memory at all, has uh, what we would call Alzheimer's disease. And the crimes are now discovered uh, of what he committed. And the local magistrate or district attorney or crown prosecutor, wherever he's living, says, well, you know, for murder, you know, there's no statute of limitations. You don't have, if you're not caught or brought to trial in seven years, you, this, which can happen with other things, some other crimes, but not with the murder. Let's say he's a serial murderer. You know, people are really upset uh, with regards to it. What do we do with this man? Well, one thing that we can do is to bring him into court and try him. That's Anglo-Saxon law. And then we can decide on the basis of the evidence where he, whether he is guilty or not guilty. And then we know what the crime, what the punishment is for that crime, and it's hanging. So we bring this man in. He has absolutely no memory. It's irretrievable, his amnesia. It's not a temporary state. He has no idea of what is going on, what people are talking about uh, that he did in the past. And then we proceed from there to the gallows and we hang him. He said, what could be more obscene than that? He said that this is the antithesis of law and a legal system and the idea of moral obligation. And why is it? Not because he didn't commit the crime. He did commit the crime. We've got all the evidence that he did. But he lacks one element of the forensic self. Forget the other selves. And that element is autobiographical memory. He does not have those autobiographical. Well, this is really a, a, a fascinating argument. And Locke uh, corresponded with French philosophers at the time. And he had one very interesting engagement with a, uh, a French philosopher. It's a wonderful idea of the, the self, the forensic self, and so on and so forth. But I want to ask a question. And the question is, what do we talk about the culpability of someone who gets drunk and then rapes someone? I mean, there, and, he has, and after the drunk, he wakes up, he has no memory of whatever he did. We bring him into court, there's the witness, he did it, no question at all, uh, and blah, blah, blah. But he doesn't have an autobiographical memory. And we know from experience that people like this don't recover the memory of what happened when they were drunk. What do we say about a person like that? That's a very interesting question. Particularly if we compare uh, uh, Japanese law, or law in Japan, with Anglo-Saxon law. Japanese, traditionally, have been very lenient with regards to people who uh, commit crimes in a, a drunken state and cannot remember what they're doing. So they tend to be quite lenient. With regards to Anglo-Saxon law, there is absolutely uh, 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 no mitigating, so you're not mitigating at all. The individual is still uh, involved. And the question if that the philosopher then poses to Locke is how does this correspond with your theory of the forensic self? And then they correspond back and forth. And Locke gives a good answer, just the answer that you would give. Uh, and he says, well, the fact is that the man is responsible for the rape because uh, it was a decision of his to get drunk and to continue drinking and so on and so forth and during that state. So, the, okay, you get the idea. Our interest is not in law, but again, this notion of a forensic self and how it uh, 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 fits in. And again, from a cultural point of view, on a cultural side, and, and I, 
have to say that so far as uh, the forensic self goes, the forensic self is a very important element within psychiatry. So it's not something we can say, well, that's all. this is a course in psychiatry. It's not a course in the law. Well, psychiatry is also concerned with regards to uh, moral accountability of the individual and so on and so forth. So they're not separated from one another. Okay, say great, I hope you're finished now. We went to one, two, three, four, five, and they come in different combinations and uh, different permutations across cultures. Maybe there are different kinds of cultural selves. Maybe there's no self. Self, self-awareness, subjectivity, I recognize now that they're not all the same thing that there is a problematic, and that problematic is very important for psychiatry, uh, particularly psychiatry that's concerned with the mind. Now, with psychiatry that's concerned entirely with psychopharmacology is able to do an end run around this because you don't have to deal with the mind. Uh, one of the great attractions of a psychiatry that's a brain-based psychiatry is that it avoids these questions. Uh, these well, fundamental philosophical questions about human nature and what we really are and so on and, and so forth, it becomes avoidable. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, you have to decide for yourself. However, historically, psychiatry, or what we now call psychiatry, has played a fundamental role, at least in the West, in our understanding of what human nature is. So. If that were to occur and psychiatry were to give up these sorts of uh, 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 questions in favor of uh, a biochemical self, and that term is often used, uh, um, uh, that um, it would be a, a change. Okay, finished. No, not quite yet. Uh, just one more term. And that term is at the very bottom, and it's the term looping. And it is a term that Ian Hacking coined uh, uh, with regards to uh, uh, the idea of the self. And Hacking's interest in looping intersects two subjects that we spoke about. Number one, the subject of the self, and particularly the idea of the self being formed, the possibility of the self being formed and maintained in social interactions, as we've seen as one vision, uh, historical vision of the self, intersects that with the notion of psychiatric classifications. Because psychiatric classifications, each psychiatric classification does define a particular kind of a self uh, in, in this regard. One of the most, I must say, awful terms that people use, but quite understandable, uh, uh, is schizophrenic. He's a schizophrenic, she's a schizophrenic. Rather than describing a person as someone, a person who has schizophrenia. So when someone has malaria, we say, ah, she's a malaric. I mean, it's a ridiculous idea. She's got a disorder, the disorder's called malaria, but she's not uh, a malaric. But yet, when we talk about psychiatric disorders, sometimes people very cruelly use terms like that. She's a depressive, he's a schizophrenic, and so on and so forth. You get uh, the idea with re uh, regards. And hacking is very interested in this. So how does this come about? Even though these are ugly terms, and I, Ian Hacking, would never use it, I understand when people use it what they're talking about. When uh, I am in the company, you see uh, people engaged in a clinical setting with a patient diagnosed with schizophrenia, uh, I understand that there is something very odd that's going on here about this person. It's not something that is made up in terms of the behavior that I observe and particularly the verbal behavior of the individual uh, and so on. And Hacking says to understand this constitution of the self that is within a clinical context, within the context of classifications, the production of schizophrenics and depressives, we've got to understand it 
again in terms of a kind of a dent collective, that is, people interacting with one another, not just one individual thinking, but a kind of an engagement, not this autonomous self, but understanding the self not as being juxtaposed to other selves, but as being a co-production of social relations with other selves. You understand the, 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 the point that he is uh, making. So I want to talk about this, and I'm going to use the term looping. Uh, and uh, looping, again, represents the intersection of classification, psychiatric classification, uh, uh, on the one hand, and the notion of self, and particularly the notion of self-awareness, that is the individual, the patient's awareness of himself as a self. Okay, nothing, nothing abstract here. It's all very concrete that he is talking about. And Hacking says, before I make my point, which is not such a complicated point, because Alan Young has done such a terrific job telling you about all the different kinds of selves and so on, it will be very easy to understand uh, now, I want to clear away the underbrush, and that is misconceptions that you may have about what I'm going to say. And these misconceptions are quite natural because they are the result of a tradition within a sociology, anthropology a bit, uh, uh, likewise, uh, having to do with the history of psychiatry. Uh, and so I want to distinguish this between what had been for a long time a popular way of understanding the intersection between the self and psychiatric classifications called labeling theory. Uh, and labeling theory was at one time, particularly in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, was a radical assault on psychiatric classifications. And, the, uh, uh, I, and part of it from within psychiatry. There were uh, psychiatrists who also made the, the critique. Uh, and the uh, notion of labeling theory is that once a label is given to uh, uh, a person uh, and the demands are made that the person conform to that label, we're inducing them in this way. We're imposing upon them uh, in this way. This is an expression of power, and it's the power of the institution over the individual. And about that time, 1950s, uh, a uh, very famous uh, article uh, was published uh, by a uh, sociologist named Rosenheim. Do any of you know Rosenheim's uh, study? Very famous uh, uh, study. It had a wonderful idea. It was at the University of Michigan. Uh, and what he did was to get a number of researchers together. And these researchers were graduate students, uh, one was someone doing a residency in psychiatry. Um, I don't think there were any psychiatrists in it, but I, and I don't remember, there were five or six of these individuals. And what he arranged to do, something he could never do today in terms of ethics reviews, maybe for all the good reasons, uh, what he uh, had them uh, do, had each of them admitted to a state mental institution uh, as psychotic. Uh, and had the work up and so on. They arrived uh, when they were brought uh, one day by a, each of them, by a doctor and so on. And no one knew. No one knew. Well, uh, no, no one knew. The people who were in charge within the, the uh, uh, state uh, medical system, they all knew, so it was not uh, that these people were lost. But once they entered the institution, no one in the institution knew who uh, uh, they were. Uh, and uh, they then uh, became part, uh, and this is before the deinstitutionalization uh, of psychotic disorders, uh, they became part of the general population. They had a bed next to the bed of other, uh, some were women and uh, most of them were men, next to, to other people and, and uh, so on. And uh, they were, uh, their job was to be an ethnographer, that is to see what in fact uh, was going on uh, 
uh, and like a real ethnographer, to be a participant observer uh, uh, in this case. And when they came in, it's really quite amusing. Uh, one part is amusing, and the amusing part is they had notebooks uh, that they brought with to, you know, to write down what was going on. Uh, and, and they were very careful with these notebooks that no one should know that they have uh, a notebook. So they would wait, go in the bathroom, and they would write. Or when it was night, no one was in the room, they, they, they would, would write their notes. And as this went on, it gradually dawned on every one of them that this behavior was perfectly normal within the institution, that there are people walking around with notepads, taking notes, nothing, you know, that's quite, the, in fact, that is not evidence that you were a spy it's a vindication that you belong here, that you're walking uh, uh, around doing. In fact, what they learned uh, in, uh, in all of the cases was that there was nothing that they could do that did not vindicate their diagnosis. That the only skeptics uh, were occasionally other patients uh, who were skeptics. But so far as the staff was concerned, uh, everything they did was a vindication of their uh, diagnosis. Some of them became quite desperate uh, 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 in doing this, and there were several cases where they pursued uh, psychiatrists and psychiatric residents down the hall and said, listen, I have to talk to you. I'm just, this is awful. I can't eat. I can't sleep. Uh, I've got to get out of here. Uh, and explain to them what was going on. And they said, well, that's interesting. I, 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 we, will, we will have to look into this. Uh, and of course, nothing happened. And uh, then two days went by, and they did it again uh, and again, uh, until finally the clinicians adapted to the individual, and they adapted by ignoring them, saying, listen, I've got a meeting. I've got to get off. We can talk about this later, that sort of thing. And ultimately, those who did not finish what had been agreed to be the length of time they were there uh, uh, had a way of getting in touch with Rosenheim, who then had them taken out of the institution. But, and he named this study Being Sane in Insane Places. Uh, and his argument of being sane in insane places is once, obviously, once you get the label, and once you've been labeled, there's no way to get out of it. Uh, it is the institution that imposes this identity uh, upon the individual and that owns the self and blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. Uh, and at about the same time, uh, there was a famous study done by Irving Goffman, uh, uh, very similar to this. So this idea of labeling theory uh, became uh, uh, very, very powerful. A British psych, a Scottish psychiatrist, uh, R.D. Lang, uh, wrote a book called The Divided Self uh, uh, about it. A very, very popular anti-psychiatry uh, critique. Hacking says, these are wonderful studies, uh, and there's a truth in them. I'm not going to say, this is junk, it's ridiculous. Quite to the contrary. He said, but that does not describe most of what goes on in psychiatry and in psychiatric diagnosis and in the kinds of classification. If we want to understand that, particularly now, uh, once we've left the era of total institutions, and that is the psychiatric hospitals that Rosenheim studied and that Goffman studied, and we look at psychiatric patients who are in the general population, Everything's changed in a fundamental way. And we've got to understand this, not in terms of a label that's being imposed upon people uh, in a way that's involuntary from their uh, point of view, irresistible from their point of view, denying to them any sense of agency and power and monopolizing it in the hands of the clinician in the hands of psychiatry, is that, that simply empirically does not describe what goes on in psychiatry today. It is better understood, it is not as a process 
have to draw arrows for you, of a top-down arrow, but rather in terms of a circle, of a loop. And it's a loop in which a diagnosis is being given to a patient. The patient recognizes this uh, diagnosis and modifies his behavior, particularly verbal behavior, which says and so on and so forth, that has an impact on the clinician and that this is going on, this loop uh, continues uh, going on. In fact, I have a much more succinct uh, uh, definition here. Looping uh, elements uh, include a system of classifications, a person who is classified and is aware of his classification and its implications. By the time we get to 2012, this is an undeniably important point, and that is the extent to which lay people, including patients or prospective patients, are aware of their classifications and what their classifications uh, constitute, what the implications of those classifications uh, are for themselves and for their, uh, uh, for their uh, families. So uh, he is aware of his classification uh, and of its implications, and he or she interacts with experts and authorities, resulting in a reciprocal modification in behavior and knowledge of the patient and his or her uh, uh, condition. So the notion of agency may be asymmetrical, that, no denying that, exists in this kind of influence, in this kind of uh, uh, going on and on with regards to So this is the notion of looping uh, and, uh, and how it fits into the idea of, of self and so on uh, and so forth. Uh, and then hacking later developed the notion uh, or proposed the notion of bio-looping. And the idea of bio-looping uh, uh, involves, which is quite frequent in psychiatry, when there's a pharmaceutical intervention uh, and behavior is being modified and which there's often, very, very often, even with regards to psychotic uh, disorders, an ongoing negotiation between the clinician and the patient with regards to uh, uh, the intake uh, of uh, therapeutic pharmaceuticals and the choice of the, the, the pharmaceuticals and, and what has got bad side effects and so on and so forth. This is not a communication from the top down. It's also a communication from the uh, uh, bottom up. But you understand, won't belabor that point, I think it's quite obvious uh, uh, what, is, uh, 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 what I'm referring to. So it's a very, very different vision of the production of a kind of a clinical self or a psychiatric uh, uh, self that hacking is proposing with looping and bio-looping. And today, uh, for uh, good reasons, labeling theory and the idea of deviance, the deviance theory is that these individuals who get the labels, if they don't accept the labels, or identified as deviants in some way, uh, that, uh, and the idea of the hegemony of experts and so on and so forth, are much, much less popular um, uh, in, in uh, uh, psychiatry and looping and bio-looping. So those are two important ideas, and perhaps you've already heard people use the terms in, during the summer. Uh, course. Okay. Does anyone, I'm finished with talking about uh, uh, self. Does anyone want to, 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 to raise a question and objection uh, about any uh, of this, about the self and so on? No, absolutely not. Of course not. And you can have one that supervenes over the other. And that would be Gallagher's point. Gallagher says the narrative self supervenes over these others, but they're all part of the self, and self is something else. I mean, th this is the presentation I've given about the various selves and looping and blah, blah, blah. What a delighted uh, David Hume. Because again, Hume's argument is not that there is no self, but show me where it is uh, and how it emerges. Uh, and likewise with regards to, to, uh, to Locke. And I think it should give 
everyone uh, a second thought about looking into the past. I mean, the, as I mentioned in the, the, the last session, even within psychiatry, there's a very, very bad habit or presumption that there is a prehistory that's essentially irrelevant, and there's history. And prehistory is from 1980 backwards, and history is from 1980 forwards. And here we have people, I mean, a lot, beginning at the end of the 19, uh, 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 17th century, already formulating questions that are of uh, primary concern, priorities for us in cultural psychiatry and psychiatry uh, altogether in 2012. And if you want to see the difference, I won't belabor the point, is to compare it with his great predecessor, Descartes. Uh, you know, cogito ergo sum. Uh, and uh, Descartes already has a mind that there's a self, but it's already preformed. It's there uh, and it's structuring the world in a way. It isn't that the world is uh, producing a self, but rather the self is structuring a world. And we have a term for that in terms of theories of structuralism. Um, okay, yeah, you, you understand the point I'm making about going to talk a little bit of language, you know, um, Chomsky's theory of language is a very Cartesian theater, a uh, Cartesian notion in the sense that this capacity for language is already there. Language is not created, but uh, in the sense the capacity is already there. Yeah, but I won't talk. Oh, it's a terrific question. Terrific, terrific. Uh, and, and I'll just touch on it uh, lightly, but uh, this way, if anybody's looking for a, a book you would like to write or a, a doctoral uh, thesis, it's, it's a very interesting question. Given what I've said about narrative, given the fact this is not my opinion, but this is a, 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 a dominant theme, a pervasive theme within psychiatry, uh, leaving aside philosophy, you know, just psychiatry, how about those psychiatric disorders where people have deficits of language. And the most obvious in this case, perhaps well, in many ways most of us will immediately think of uh, autism spectrum disorders, that along that spectrum you, you have it. Uh, and uh, I had myself the mind of a wonderful experiment. And experiment would be with people diagnosed with uh, uh, autism spectrum uh, uh, disorder who have language seem to have language deficits of some have other de cognitive deficits uh, as well, and ask them to tell stories. Can they tell stories? Uh, because this will tell us something about the self and so on and so forth. Well, it is a great idea, but it has occurred to many people before me. I learned, and there's much experimental uh, uh, work uh, on it. Um, that's really quite interesting, showing that the capacity to form narratives, really quite recent uh, 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 research, and findings are interesting in matching groups and also matching them, uh, 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 particularly when you're talking about the, the high functioning autism and Asperger's syndrome and normal individuals, because you can match people for IQ. See, in a way, it's not fair if you can't match them for IQ. There are other sort. Well, then you can match them for IQ, too. I shouldn't say that, uh, uh, with normal controls. But in any event, uh, with the, the uh, results of the study I just read uh, very, very uh, uh, recently, uh, was the capacity of all the individuals participating, all the participants in the experiment, the controls and the uh, autism spectrum people, to make narratives but that the narratives were fundamentally different. Uh, and one difference is described by the researchers is that the these are autobiographical narratives, that the uh, narrative of the controls, if you could look at this uh, topographically, have got peaks uh, of interest and, and so on. And then there's a kind of prosody, a kind of a rhythm, a kind melody and so on and so forth that goes through it and it's thematic and so on. Uh, with regards to the autism spectrum individuals, there were very, very few peaks. It was all very, very flat. Uh, the memories are there. They're all tied together. 
And in a way, it's the difference, I'm, this is what I'm saying, the difference between a, an account of the past that a historian gives us that is a chronology versus a history. A chronology is you know, just a, a, a series of facts uh, that are connected to one another temporally. A history, we expect a lot more from a history. Uh, and some intimation of causality and so on and so forth. And specifically this notion of causality was one of uh, uh, conspicuously absent in many of the narratives of the autism spectrum individual. So the question you asked is a very, very interesting one, and one would hope in the future there would be more research on this as the notion of the narrative self becomes more uh, pervasive. Why don't we take off? Well, there is no reason not to take off uh, and uh, get coffee.